You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. This is the Option Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell security or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of the ways the message is spread. OIC also offers a variety of other resources to those interested in learning more about options, including webinars, podcasts, and live events. For more information, check out optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, OIC's Director of Individual Investor Education, Joe Burgoyne. Today's program is a rebroadcast from OIC's webinar program. Every month, we do webinars on a variety of options-related topics. Check out optionseducation.org for more information. Enjoy the show. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started. We're glad you could join us for our annual summit series. My name is Alexander, and I'll be guiding you through today's summit series. Our final session will be moderated by Joseph Burgoyne, who will lead a spirited discussion on how options professionals use technical analysis as they're forming an opinion on underlying assets. I'm pleased to introduce you to Joe Burgoyne, the Director of Retail Education at the Options Industry Council. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Burgoyne will bring you our topic today, Options Pros Talk Technical Analysis. Joe? Alex, thanks so much. And uh, most importantly, thanks to everybody for joining us. I know it's been a big day. This is round four here at the OIC. We started with the fundamental uh, analysis of things and uh, just had a very, um, I guess, uh, base building, uh, meaningful presentation by John Savanto, and we appreciate that. And now we've got uh, a group of three industry pros who are here to talk technical analysis with you. And uh, I will say we have... Um, you know, three people who have been in the industry quite some time. Ken Jennings joining us from uh, Fidelity Investments. He's a regional uh, brokerage consultant for Fidelity in the north central region of the U.S. We've got uh, Nina Malovic, a uh, member of the education team at Schwab, as well as Rick Swope, VP of uh, the investor education team at E-Trade. So uh, welcome, the three of you. Thank you, Joe. Great to be here. Uh, My pleasure. I, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Ken, uh, Nina, and Rick. Before I turn it back to you, let me do uh, a little bit of housekeeping here. I think uh, most folks know uh, who the IOC is, the uh, Options Industry Council, founded in 1992 and, uh, you know, funded by the Options Clearing Corporation, uh, which is the foundation for secure markets in the U.S., um, OIC, as I mentioned, was founded in 92, five parent companies, uh, CBO, NASDAQ, Box, MIAX, and the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, also, we have uh, 
you know, one of the slides that goes back to the, the start of, of the options industry, the listed options industry in 73. Uh, we go back to uh, the SIBO being the first exchange in April of 73. We're now up to uh, 15 different exchanges with the parent companies I just mentioned. Uh, on average at this point, the industry is doing, well, over the last few years, we've averaged between 16 and 17 million contracts a day this year. Actually, with uh, increased volatility, we're, we're just shy of 21 million contracts a day. So a lot of business, uh, a lot of people uh, using fundamental analysis, technical analysis as a foundation for their approach to options, and, and that's what we're going to get into. So uh, let me go back to our panelists. Uh, Ken, uh, again, thanks for joining us. Why don't you say hello to everybody and you know, tell folks a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for the opportunity. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I am the regional brokerage consultant for Fidelity Investments. Uh, the North Central region might be a little Greek to some folks out there, but basically I'm headquartered in Chicago, and I support 17 offices for Fidelity Investments. And really what I'll do is either in person or through screen sharing, uh, you know, over a phone call, the Internet, or just, you know, phone conversations, I work with Fidelity's uh, self-directed investors and in really ensuring that they're optimizing our tools and resources for their investment needs. So, you know, those conversations really run the gamut. Uh, it's, it's a great teaching job, especially if you're a fan of the markets, uh, as I am. Um, you know, I'm teaching people about, you know, the differences, pros and cons of mutual funds, ETFs, helping people you know, build portfolios, and, and more importantly, and, and, and really here recently, you mentioned with the recent volatility, a lot of education on options. You know, I can't really recommend strategies for clients, but they'll come to me with a strategy the way that th they see things to play out, and, you know, I've taken upon myself to, you know, no pun intended, go over their options in terms of different strategies and make sure they know the pros and cons so, you know, they can make the most informed decisions possible. So, you know, that kind of sums up what I do day to day. My territory is from St. Louis up through Chicago to Minneapolis and all the way out west uh, to Omaha. So anybody on the call, if, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, you can really ask any Fidelity representative about Ken Jennings, the regional brokerage consultant, and they'll be able to get a hold of me. That's great, Ken. Uh, we appreciate it. Look forward to your, uh, you know, your, your comments here on the technical analysis side of things. Uh, Nina? a uh, member of the education team at Schwab. Would you like to uh, say a little something about yeah. yourself? Sure, Joe. I've been on the Schwab education team for now over six years. Previously, I was with Options Express. I started with Options Express in 2003, So, and Schwab bought Options Express in 2011. So it's been quite a while since I've, I've – so what I do at Schwab and previously at Options Express, I present online classes. I also travel all over the country. I made some international trips as well, where I talk about different option strategies, how they work, also talk about the markets, and then I also host online events with special guests as well. Now, before working for Options Express, I did trade on the floor of the CBOE. I was an options market maker in a few different equity pits, and I also was a member of the arbitration committee and the stock selection committee. And, uh, and uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Thanks, Joe. Well, thanks. Thank you, Nina. And uh, finally, Rick Swope, as I mentioned, VP of Investor Education at E-Trade. Rick, uh, say hello. Hey, Joe, and thank you for having me on today. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, for joining today. Yeah, I, I, uh, I lead the education team for E-Trade, and we are primarily responsible for uh, various forms of education, as the other uh, panelists have mentioned, uh, uh, digital education. Uh, we do live events around the country, uh, and uh, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of stuff online. So we've got uh, various folks that uh, work with me on that team. Uh, I just joined E-Trade last year as part of the family after having worked with them for about 15 years as a third-party education provider. So we've been with them for quite some time. I actually got my start. Uh, back in the mid-90s, before there was anything uh, like online trading, when uh, some, if some of you have been around for a while, you might remember back in the days when you had to go into a trading office if you wanted to do trading. 
and I was uh, I was a manager of one of those trading offices. So uh, they, that was back in the days, if you might remember, they were called Sows Bandits or uh, Day Trading scal- Scalpers. Uh, let's just say it was it wasn't quite as orderly and regulated as it is today, but uh, nevertheless, it was a lot of fun and a good way to start. Um, at heart, I'm really a teacher. Uh, I spent some years as a uh, as a faculty member teaching of all things probability and statistics. So uh, when you boil it down to it, uh, technical analysis, I, I love, which I guess makes me a trading geek. So that's, uh, that's, that's the Reader's Digest version. Looking forward to today's discussion. Fantastic, Rick. Uh, trading geeks are great. And uh, I think how, how we'd like to start this, maybe uh, for everybody listening in, we'd like to give um, Rick Nina and Ken an opportunity to take some time to speak about their approach to technical analysis, uh, you know, the philosophy and, and how they go about incorporating uh, what they find with listed options. So, Rick, how about if uh, we start with you? Absolutely. You know, Joe, you, you, uh, I'm going to flip it the other way around. You, you just mentioned that about 80% of the folks use technical analysis, but what I was looking at is 20% don't. And, that's, uh, I, and, and, and half of the folks have used it for less than five years, which tells me that there's a, a continuing opportunity for technical analysis uh, in uh, not just for stock traders but for options traders as well. So I'm going to take about four or five minutes, um, and I think we're all going to be doing this, and just kind of giving – Everybody, a, a picture of where I come from uh, in in technical analysis. Um, when I look at a chart, I am really trying to answer a couple of questions and characterize it in a couple of ways. The first question that I want to answer is, who's in control? Or is it the buyers or the sellers, or is it nobody? Um, if if I'm a buyer, it's it's great to be contrarian, and you know, folks say, well, Warren Buffett says that you're supposed to be a buyer when everybody's selling. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we all have uh, accounts a fair bit smaller than Warren Buffett. So we're going we're gonna to look at what the market's doing and, and see what is going on from a control standpoint. Is it the buyers? Is it the sellers? Or are they just having a tug of war and going back and forth? The second question is, within that, what does the trend and the volatility look like? And I've got a slide that I've, I think – there we go. The first thing that I'm looking at is trend. And it's the it's the part of the market that I think we gravitate toward the, the the quickest. Trend tells me does the stock go from point A to point B, but that's not the whole story. See, I, if if you look at this slide, I can have a stock that moves from a stra- in a straight line from point A to point B, and that's a certain trend. But I can have another stock that also goes from point A to point B, as evidenced by the dash line. And that's an entirely different activity. It's the same trend, but it's a different volatility. If the only thing I look at is trend, then I'm missing a huge part of the market, and especially as an option trader. Um, I can't just make a guess on where the market's going. So when I, look at, uh, when I look at technical analysis, the first thing that I want to see is who's in control, what is the trend, and what is the volatility. Now, we'll probably dive into this a lot deeper through the discussion, but – the way that I the way that I like to paint volatility is it's risk. It is the uncertainty of time ahead of us. We simply don't know what tomorrow or what the next day or the day after looks like. And you know sometimes it looks a little bit like the uh, if you've ever seen the uh, the hurricane cones when they're projecting hurricanes. You know the 24 hour cone doesn't look that wide, but as you get farther out and you get to looking at the five day or the seven day cone, um, it covers half the country. Well, it's the same with stocks. If you if you want to try to make a projection for a short term, there's a, some amount of volatility. But the farther you get out, the more volatility you have. So the, the, the end game or the goal when I look at technical analysis is trying to say who's in control, where is it going, and how is it going there. Um, one, one other quick slide, and I'll, uh, I'll finish with this part of the introduction. Um, I'm a big fan of candlesticks. And using simple approaches to this analysis, whether it's simple moving averages, I mean, in this slide that I have right here, uh, for example, just looking at the candlesticks, I can immediately make an assessment of the difference between relatively low and relatively high volatility by looking at the length of the candles and the shadows, because that tells me the range of trading, and range is really our simplest measure of volatility. So as I look at that, 
this this is the kind of stuff that I'm 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 after. I'm not I'm not trying to dive real deep into uh, stochastics and modifying parameters and that kind of stuff. I want a picture because ultimately the chart is going to tell me a story, and my job is to sit back and listen to the story. Joe, that's uh, that, hopefully I kept it within the time frame for a quick intro. I'll leave it with that for now. Okay, fantastic work. And actually, a few of the things you said I, I just love. Who who is in control? What a, what a great way to define a stock chart, and then this whole idea of vol volatility being the risk. Uh, just really good stuff. Nina, you're up next. All right. Now I have a different background. So when I originally started in trading. I had three financial backers who were also very, very successful options floor traders and who had been in the industry for quite a while. And they were training me. They explained to me how, how you can make markets. They also taught me how you can hedge your positions and also manage your positions. And as it turned out, they didn't want me to use charts because the market-making model that they used believed in a random walk where the stock that's price that's, that's coming next can't be predicted. They didn't want me to use charts because they felt that I could fall in love with a chart and miss a hedge and not um, – or just not hedge at all, waiting for the price to – just uh, you know, you know, miraculously show up, and then it's their money. I could be taking on a lot of risk, and they didn't want that. So basically, we didn't look at charts, and their philosophy was, well, if you really, you know, knew where the stock was going to go, just trade the stock. I mean, that was their philosophy. If you're going to trade for us, uh, hedge the way we want. And, uh, and so that's what I did. I didn't look at charts. So that wasn't, you know, wasn't my background. And so then as I, you know, left the floor and moved upstairs, I started to notice, you know, there is something to using different technical studies. And so, but, but I like to keep it simple. All right, I don't like to pile on all these studies. I like to look at moving averages, the typical ones that, that the industry looks at, that, uh, that institutions look at, the 50-day. So I look at the 50-day, but I'm an options trader, so I'm putting on trades that are shorter time frames, so I like to look at the 20-day. I really don't use the 10-day. So it's the 20-day, 50-day, and I look at those crossovers. And then I also like to pay attention to the 200-day. And, uh, and then I also like to use, because it seems to fit just my original background and not really using charts much, I like to also use Bollinger Bands because it takes into account that middle, that middle, uh, that middle period that you see is a 20-day moving average. And then it also incorporates the concept of standard deviations. So it's like a 20 standard deviation band up up and down and so I like to incorporate that into my stock chart to help me see see where the stock is right now relationship to the different averages and where it is within that two standard deviation and then how tight those the Bollinger Bands are so that's what you know that's what I like to use and another thing is here's a little cheat that I do is, because I'm not a technical analyst, is I use Recognia. And Recognia is a third-party tool, and it's also available at other brokerage firms as well. I think our competitors online, I think many of you have it as well. And Recognia is great if you're not a technical analyst. You simply type in your stock sim symbol into the tool, and then what it does is it tells you which different technical formations have recently happened, which ones are bullish, bearish, then you can click on them, read about it, because I do have a hard time remembering exactly, you know, where a particular price should be for a particular study to trigger. And so I use Recognia, and it also tells me what studies are being, what technical 
for patterns are, are possibly in the works. So you could see what's coming ahead to look for that and set up price alerts. So if it goes to a certain level, it could be for formulating another study. So that's what I like to use. I keep it simple. I do use the charts, but I, need, I do need some assistance. So that's why I turn to Recognia. Okay. All right, Joe? Very good, Nina. That's, that's excellent. Ken, I'm going to come to you in just a second. Oh. Nina, I want to come back to you uh, for one thing, and that was just a little bit okay. about the Bollinger Bands. You know, with sure. the Bollinger Bands, you can define that band, correct? You How can. wide they're going to be? Okay, so did you say you use a two standard deviation, you know, width, or yes. did I misunderstand? Okay. Uh, the right. two standard deviation, two standard, and I oh. use the 20-day period, just the regular Bowler, Bollinger Band, the default. Oh. Okay, very good. Just wanted to clarify that. Uh, Ken, how about if we hear uh, your thoughts on your philosophy and approach to the technical analysis? Yes, a absolutely. Thank you, Joe. I mean, one way that I'm looking at it is this, and, you know, obviously – I could have this discussion a little differently if I was talking to folks that were extremely short-term, i.e. day traders, but the vast majority of the folks I'm, I'm with, you might classify as momentum-type uh, traders or investors where they're hoping to be in something for, you know, potentially weeks, months to years if you get something that, that truly, uh, you know, continues to move. And certainly options can be used in a tremendous array of trade setups and strategies. But it really all starts with you trying to make a market call. You know, all strategies work. It's just sometimes they don't. You know, you can make money in any market, but, the, you know, the trick is obviously trying to, as Rick said, figure out who's in control, i.e., what's the trend. You know, if you can isolate the time frame you're operating within, maybe you're looking at a six-month daily chart, a one-year chart, you know, you know, I think moving averages are a very simple way of, of, of ascertaining trend. Is the slope of the 200-day moving average positive like it is now? Well, that's indicative of an uptrend. Are your securities uh, that you're following above or below those trend lines? Um, you know, do we see things trading in a range? Like, the, really, the market has been trading really sideways since mid-January. And, and what I'm doing is I'm using technical analysis. When you, when you break it down, it's the study of market action. And what I'm doing, even though the past is no guarantee of future results, there isn't anything that we don't do in our everyday lives where we don't use the past to at least set an expectation for future results, whether that's how long it takes you to drive to work or, you know, how long your kid's baseball game is going to be. And, you know, every now and then you're going to get some curveballs thrown at you because even though you might be able to, you know, know what the trend is, we don't know what's to the right of that chart. So really, I'm using technical analysis for a few things. One, to try to give me a sense of the market environment I'm in so I'm able to figure out what strategies I can apply to the market I see going forward. And, and then secondly, whether or not I'm using tools like Recognia, which, of course, you know, Fidelity has. I really like things like, and I can talk about this later, you know, chart patterns. You know, if I can have a tool, certainly I can identify them myself, but as I'm scanning my symbols in my watch list, it's really nice to have a tool to say all of a sudden here, you know, this pattern was completed yesterday, and, you know, I can use the time frame from which that pattern had formed. I can use the price targets that the pattern lays out, you know, to help me choose my expirations and strikes. So really what it comes down to with technical analysis, it's, it's really the only way I can be down and dirty to make an education, educated guess of future moves. And I come at it from this perspective, especially for the intermediate to longer term. You know, I know that there's hundreds of ETFs out there. I know Fidelity alone has 13,000-plus mutual funds, and that's not counting the funds or ETFs in all the foreign countries. They're all buying the same shares of Apple, including the endowments out there, including the, you know, the hedge fund guys, the Carl icons of the world. They're all chasing the same shares of Apple, if I could use that as an example. And what I like about technical analysis and identifying these trends is, taking advantage of probably the only advantage I have against these whales, and it's the ability of myself, you know, to get in and out with one click of the mouse. So, you know, when traders are, are trying to identify these uptrends, we really just want a piece of the middle. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're here learning to try to how to find the bottom and get out at the top, I'll save you a whole lot of time and, and tell you to stop right now because that doesn't exist. And if it did, you know, Rick, Nina, myself, we wouldn't take the time to be on these, these types of calls. But what we are doing is we're trying to use a set of rules 
to not only help us identify trading uh, opportunities, but more importantly, when to time them. The fundamentals of Apple have not really changed over the last 15, 20 years. They've continuously gotten better, higher earnings, more cash, you know, so on and so forth. But obviously, if you've ignored the technicals, you know, it, it's really kind of caused you, you know, to either miss out on opportunities in other parts of the market or really being in the stock at very inopportune times. Now, yes, you could have bought Apple 15 years ago and held it today and made a lot of money, but you could have also bought BlackBerry and done the same thing. And if you wait for the fundamentals to deteriorate, you know, un, you know, unless you haven't figured it out already, stocks are always looking ahead. And, you know, for stocks to continue higher, to keep that trend going higher, you know, we're going to continuously new, need new information, fundamental or otherwise, that continues to exceed our expectations to keep pressing these asset prices higher. So really, I use technical analysis as a way to really analyze stocks more efficiently. Uh, I'm not saying fundamentals aren't important, but if I was going to do true fundamental analysis on a basket of stocks, I, I, I'm just not going to have the time or the resources because just looking at a research report or reading a, an earnings call announcement just doesn't cut the mustard if you're going to do true hardcore fundamentals. So, you know, just to kind of summarize, I use technicals to help me with my stock selection, my stock timing, and, you know, my, my market calls and really my strategy selection. But the whole time, and, and probably not for this seminar, you know, it's always the need for risk management in case, in case obviously you are wrong, which you will be. Ken, that's, that's very good. Uh, we will come back to you with the whole chart pattern, um, you know, question. And I just want to clarify, sure. so we're not here to be picking bottoms and selling tops? I'm, I'm only teasing. I'm, well, you know completely. what, you know. Yeah, you know what completely. they say about – there you go. <laughs> so, um, you know, this we're, – we're, we're in the options space, obviously. We're the Options Industry Council. So, you know, we're, we're going through the whole idea of fundamental uh, discussion, technical discussion. Let's, let's – we're going to, you know, stay with the technical approach, but I, I do want to try to transition, you know, when we find, you know, different things coming out of our technical analysis. How do we apply that? to our options trading, whether it's uh, talking about strategy selection, strike price selection. Nina, would you kick that off to tell us how you transition your findings? Well, after I check out the implied volatility and where I think it's going, because that's crucial to options, and then you're using your technicals for where you, you know, if you have a bullish, bearish, or maybe you feel the stock's going to channel and stay in a range. After you do that technical analysis, then what you can do is use the chart to help pick your, your strike prices. So let's say you've determined that you wouldn't mind selling a put because you, you would like to get that option premium, you'd like to sell an out-of-the-money put, you feel that the stock you know, could drop, but maybe you found a support level and you're selling your put, let's say, below that support level where you feel, you know what, buyers will probably start coming in that level. You know, maybe I'll sell a put just below that and try to capture that premium or maybe try to buy back that option at least at a lower price than what you sold it for. Uh, and so that's why I like to incorporate technical analysis for the actual strike price selection. But it's, it's not just the charts because if I'm selling puts, the put that I'm selling, that strike that I'm selling, is at a level where I'm comfortable purchasing the stock at. Because if I don't ever want to buy the stock, then you don't do the strategy. You don't do it just for the premium. So you always have to look beyond beyond the chart and, and what what ultimately are your rights and your obligations for the strategy. And so that's Makes just an sense. example. Or it could help. Or if you didn't, uh, if you wanted to sell a put, well, maybe, you know, you could look at the chart and you could sell a put spread. You could look for a, a put that can help select that strike. Or sometimes you simply have to go by the risk, the defined risk, and the premiums that are out there. And uh, sometimes well, it's just what's available to trade. Uh, before I go to Rick with this, I want to go back to where you started. And uh, I know we're talking technical analysis, but you said, you know, your volatility analysis. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because you said how important it was. 
Well, when volatility is high, those times values will be higher. Those extrinsic values will be higher. So if you're selling into lower volatility, you're just the marketplace is pricing in that you're not taking on as much risk, and so you won't get paid as much. And when volatility is high, you're going to get paid more, but then the probability of that option being in the money will be greater. So that's what you'll have to balance for yourself, what that risk and what that reward is. And so I might sell puts, into higher volatility if I don't mind potentially being a shareholder. Because what if, you know, the stock, you know, doesn't stay at that support and that support becomes the new resistance level, you know, and that can happen. So that's why, you know, just only believing in the chart, well, stocks don't follow the charts. They can, you know, move outside of those levels. Indeed, they can. And I know I'm going off track a little bit. I'm going to stay on this just a little bit more. When you talk about volatility being high versus low, how do you personally track that? Now, that's another thing. It's not fixed. Volatility changes over time. So, what's high volatility right now? You know, what's high volatility right now might be actually pretty low to what it was before. So, it's all relative. It changes over time. It changes with your stock. It changes with, you know, different sectors. But typically you'll, you'll find periods where volatility is higher in general, right before earnings. And then after earnings, you'll typically see volatility drop off significantly. And then maybe in between earnings, you'll find a low period of volatility. But that doesn't mean movement won't happen. It just means the marketplace is not pricing in for it. So, so. You can take advantage of those high volatilities to sell, um, but, you know, you have to understand that risk. And then when volatility is low, you know, maybe it still does move. So, so that's the thing. You, you have to have an outlook, but prices change and situations change. So and, ultimately yeah, that, you have me, to know your uh, risk. You do, and, and that to me is what makes the options market so much, so dynamic and so much fun, the fact that, you know, prices are, you know, changing all the time. Um, Rick, I know I went off a little bit on the ball discussion there, but uh, you, you want to bring us back to, you know, your technical analysis findings and how you apply that to, you know, your option your strategy selection, strike selection, things of that nature. You bet. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I try to impress upon folks when I'm talking to them is that an option, I mean, think about the name, an option's called a derivative, which means it's derived from something. So if you ignore the activity that's going on in the underlying, you're missing a huge part of the story. So what I try to relate to folks is that the technical analysis is going to drive what you're, what, what you're going to do with the option and how you're going to do it. So when I look at, uh, I mean, ultimately, I'm, my profit or loss is going to be related to the price of the premium. The premium is a function of intrinsic value and time value. Well, what's intrinsic value? That's that's the price of the underlying uh, compared to the strike price. So that is directly associated with what's happening with the stock. And then the time value is going to be heavily influenced by the volatility, as, as Nina was just mentioning. So if you don't have an understanding of where the thing is going and how it's going, then you're, you're really shooting in the dark with this. So what I do is I, I, I try to see what the story is from the charts. I try to understand what's going on with the underlying as best as possible. I do like, I, I like the way Ken said, we're not fortune tellers on this. I'm paraphrasing him. We're not fortune tellers. But the best guide we have to inform our future decisions is what's going on right now. And so my goal is to try to recognize changes as quickly as possible. That's, that's a, there's a big difference there in trying to predict the future. So if I could see what has happened, when things are changing as quickly as possible, then I could respond accordingly with my option strategy. And, and yes, I mean, everything in my analysis, whether it's identifying support and resistance to help uh, inform where I'm going to choose my strike prices, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, looking at, at volatility, and I'll, I'll put another plug in. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Bollinger Bands because it captures both volatility and trend 
in a single indicator. So it's a it's one of actually one of my favorite indicators to use uh, for looking at uh, looking at option setups. Huh? For just for example, I'll I'll take a look at Bollinger bands. Um, and I also use the two standard deviation uh, uh, envelope on that. Uh, if I'm doing something like an iron condor, I will be looking to do my, my short legs right outside the bands. And I can see, based on how those bands change over time, if I've got very tight bands and can be looking at higher premium or, or wider bands and, and, and maybe not so much so because I have to go farther out to stay outside my, my probability window. But it's it's everything that I do, from the simplest strategy to uh, to, to spreads and, and other types of strategies, always begins by a thorough analysis of what it is that I'm looking to trade on the underlying. Let me ask you I this. I like your comments uh, the on the Bollinger Band. Nope. Sorry about that. I like those comments no, on the Bollinger that's... Bands. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and and I had a, a question about that, Rick. So. You mentioned the iron condor. So let's say we're banging up against the top end of the band. Are you only going to yep. do the call spread and wait the leg into the put spread? Walk me through that. Yeah, that's, in yeah, that's interesting. You could do it that way. I tend to go both spreads at the same time, but I might skew a little bit more towards, uh, you know, toward – the uh, the side that it's bumping up against. So uh, I know people that leg into. Personally, I don't leg into iron condors. I like to have it set up and ready to go because I like that. I like to have my risk reward profile fully defined right up front. But nevertheless, it is the bands that that dictate where those um, where those uh, strike prices are set. Now sometimes. If I see that that I've got wider bands and they have not been pressing the bands recently, I'll bring the short leg inside and take the long leg just outside, which makes the probability of going out all the way out past the spread fairly slim. Uh, but again, you know, the beauty about that is if somebody else wants to use a one standard deviation band, I want to use a two standard deviation band. Or there's so much flexibility in technical analysis. Uh, you know, my, my trading is just chock full of, uh, of sayings, and one, one saying that I like to use is the worst trade you could take is somebody else's. Um, we can tailor everything to our own strategies and our own desires, and that's the beauty about incorporating technical analysis. There's so much flexibility in that. Couldn't agree more. It is an art form, and frankly, it's why I love doing panels, because the three of you bring your different perspectives to this art form to the table. and. You know, Ken, how about yourself? You know, taking the analysis and applying it to, you know, option strategies and strikes. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I just wanted to piggyback on something that was mentioned earlier by Nina, just about, you know, implied and historical volatility. That is like real estate. It's local. I mean, what might be high for one stock wouldn't be for another, just like a million-dollar home in uh, Naperville might mean one thing, but a million-dollar home in Winneka isn't going to buy you as much. So, you know, most firms will have tools that let you know, at least at Fidelity, you can see on a 52-week range where the calls and puts lie in terms of the historical volatility, which would be, you know, how volatile has the stock been over the last, say, 20, 30, 60, 90 days, and then compare that to the implied volatility, which is what does the options market think the move is going to be? You know, so when I'm educating clients on options, you know, is to make sure they are aware that, you know, not counting, you know, bid-ask spreads and commissions, it's really a zero-sum game. So if someone has an advantage, like, you know, premium sellers, their advantage is time, then that's got to be the disadvantage to, you know, whoever bought the options. So I want to make sure when I'm educating clients on options, they're fully aware of things like time decay, changes in volatility. Now, you know, to get back to kind of your original, you know, ask there in terms of how I'm using this and blending technicals with options, I think I'll just piggyback with, you know, my being a fan of chart patterns. You know, I'm a big fan of trend trading, and stocks can go up, and we're watching it with things like NVIDIA and Square and how they continue up. And I've always said it's like walking up a, up a roof blindfolded. You know, you don't know where the roof is going to crest, but you know it will, and you don't know if it's just going to drop you off onto the sidewalk or not. So that, those are the types of strategies where if you used leaps and, you know, treat it as stock replacement, you can really leverage your money and define your risk and, and, and make a lot that way. But what I like about chart patterns is that I can more clearly define not just my risk but my time horizon. And, you know, again, a third-party tool like Recognia, Recognia can help me out with this 
or I'm scanning my charts, and it'll let me know if something has a, a double bottom or a double top. These are reversal patterns of trends. And, uh, you know, whenever we have these patterns, whether they're flags or wedges or, you know, uh, channels or double bottoms, double tops, you know, they all tell us a story. And what I like about it is that when these patterns are complete, we have two pieces of information that can be very important to an options trader to help them select their strikes and expirations. One, what was the length of the time for this pattern to form? You know, so if I have a double bottom that's formed over a period of, say, you know, four weeks, then, you know, maybe if I'm going to use options to take advantage of that, I'm going to make sure my expirations go out a little bit beyond that. More importantly, you know, I know where, in, for example, a double bottom, for those of you that aren't aware, just try to, you know, picture a W pattern. And as the chart makes a low and bounces and comes down and bounces off a similar price point, you now have an anticipated event forming. And Recogni will even clue you in on anticipated events. But once we rally between that middle peak, you know, that signals a confirmation of the pattern. It's one of my more favorite patterns because you're really not trying to hit a home run, so you can hit for average a little bit better here. And I just find it a little uncanny, you know, that stocks are able to reach that profit target, which is basically derived from measuring from that middle peak down to the double bottom. Now, whether or not you want to use points or percentages, that's entirely up to you. Um, you know, what I like about that is that it restricts my flexibility. You know, f you know flexibility kind of cuts both ways. You know, all these technical indicators, they have their time and a place, and I think you have a question for us in the, in the end to kind of come to grips with this phenomenon, but I always tell clients, if you treat each indicator and tool as an arrow in your quiver, I, I would implore you to limit the arrows in your quiver. You know, not throughout your trading lifetime, but when you're analyzing a given trade, because if you don't limit – the tools that you're using, you're almost just trying to find what you want to see. And what I mean by that is, let's say we go three trading days ago with General Electric. I, you know, I could probably find both bullish, bearish, and or very easy to find bearish, and, and neutral technical signals, you know, to, to signal me to do something. So, you know, if I'm only using things like moving averages or trend lines, you know, maybe that keeps me out of the majority of the pain over the last few years. But if I've been looking for a bottom and I want a bottom, um, I would have found evidence to, you know, to buy, whether it was fundamental or technical, at any point in maybe not just the last few years, the last you know, 20 years. So you know, I just want to make sure as I go into the trade, my strategy is sort of mapped out, not just how I intend to capitalize on this, but more importantly, you know, where am I going to place my stops you know, below this in case this pattern breaks down and it doesn't work. So you know, I just want to make sure I have that mapped out going into the trade so I'm not change my mind on the fly, which I think is a common mistake that folks make. Well, you know, in terms of how many arrows or tools, I think you can apply, you know, the number of option strategies as well. Um, to you, uh, Ken, how many technical indicators, you know, do you think is an appropriate number? Well, uh, the, you know, that's like, uh, obviously it's all relative. I mean, the Supreme Court yep. said they couldn't define pornography, but they know it and they see it. I can't really define the appropriate number of indicators, but sometimes I'll look at a client's chart and say, wow, that's, that's too many. But if they're not using every indicator for every trade, who, who am I to judge? I mean, I don't know. I, I've been a big fan of keeping it maybe somewhere around three, but really having something that's more primary and maybe using some secondary things. Personally, I like to use moving averages uh, and chart patterns just to see if these trends are reversing or continuing. Uh, and, and then I also like to keep a close eye on things like relative strength, uh, you know, just to see, you know, as stocks hit previous price points, you know, is the strength there to kind of carry on or, or do we seem to be running out of steam? And, and then from there, you know, to piggyback on Rick's love of, uh, you know, candlesticks, I, I kind of share the same affinity there. I will pay attention to certain candlestick patterns as well. Uh, not all of them. There's certainly more than enough to shake a stick at, but some of the ones that I pay particularly uh, attention to might be shooting star formations, which you might see at the tops of charts, but really like bearish and, and bullish engulfing candles. You know, a lot of times they can be a strong signal of at least the change in trend, whether that's the the end of a pullback and a rally. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to end a one- or two-year trend, but it can give you a good clue about what the next few trading days would be like. So I guess well, to answer your question, I generally keep it right around three or four. 
Okay. And, um, you know, this is being recorded for uh, folks, you know, listening in. We're throwing a lot of different terms and strategies at you. So, you know, be sure to go back and listen again if, if you need to. Nina, how about you in terms of do you have a sweet spot for number of indicators? Yeah. I mean, really, I'm thinking three, a, a trend okay. indicator, some type of oscillator, and then something for volume, you know. Very good. Something for the, the stock volume. Excellent. Rick, yourself? Yeah, you know, I, I my basic chart starts with a candlestick chart, a uh, volume histogram on the bottom, and two moving averages. I use a 50-day simple and a 200-day simple. That's my go, that is my go-to chart. I get a lot of information from that. Um, what I find probably is one of the biggest mistakes is layering on too many indicators that give you essentially the same thing or become uh, cross-confirming. And people make the mistake of thinking that it's additional confirmation. For example, um, two oscillating indicators that more or less tell you the same thing are the stochastic indicator and the relative strength indicator. The only difference is one is generated from an average gain or loss, and the other is generated from extreme data points. But if you were lay them on to each other, if you were bo lay both of those onto a chart, you'll have double the confirmation, but you're getting you're using the same data for the same conclusion. So what I what the, the rule that I like to use is why? Why are you using it? If you're using it because you read it in a book or somebody made a recommendation, then it's not appropriate for you. If you can answer the question, what does this do to help me make a decision, then it may very well be appropriate. So for me, I start very simple. I'm, I'm, I'm a minimalist when it comes to technical analysis, but I'll use the right tool at the right time. That's, you know, whether it's, as, as Ken mentioned, as a, a, a candlestick chart in, you know, in conjunction with a price pattern. Uh, if I've got a strong trend, I might be looking for something that's going to help me identify a trend reversal. If I've got something moving in a channel, then obviously I'm not going to use a moving average or a trending indicator. I'm going to look for something that's, that does better as an oscillating indicator. So it, it's, it's all situation-specific, but definitely a minimalist. That's, that's the easiest way I can describe it. Okay, very good. Uh, Ken, I want to go back to you. You mentioned the importance of moving averages, but could I ask you which ones that you focus in on? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, I use a 50 and a 200, but every now and then I like to switch to a 100-day moving average, and generally that's if I'm in a, in a winning trade. It's, it's the type of moving average that gives me the opportunity to be in a trade for many months to, to a year plus, um, because as I mentioned before, a lot of times I, I like to play really the leaps because it's a lot cheaper for me to buy, uh, you know, contracts that expire and 2020 in January than for me to buy the, the actual underlying. Um, now, you know, I guess I would kind of, you know, and I, I would advise our clients, you know, our, our listeners to do this as well. You know, my strategies have been kind of morphed around what I'm able to put into this as well. So I'm pretty busy throughout the day, which is why I'm not as short term perhaps as I used to be. Now, I will use simple moving averages. They all have their pros and cons. I'm not saying this is better or worse, but, you know, you, you tend to use what the environment sort of presents to you. And the reason why I say it that way is Fidelity has some neat tools where I can easily set up real-time alerts to be texted to me, whether or not securities, ETFs, or indexes cross the 20, 50, or 200 exponential moving average. Now, for those of you that aren't aware, the exponential moving average places heavier weightings to the recent day's uh, closing prices as opposed to the earliest, so they tend to keep a little closer tab. So this is kind of convenient for me. So I could get a signal that my security is either crossed up through or down below a particular moving average, and odds are, unless the move is pretty dramatic, uh, I'm still a little bit away from my simple moving averages because they just place equal importance on the average price uh, over time. So, you know, the reason why I will switch to, the, to 100 is pretty simple. I mean, take a look at a chart of Domino's Pizza right now or maybe take a look at a chart of Square or, you know, the, the Chinese Netflix IQ. You know, hopefully a lot of folks maybe have been stopped out of that one by now. But, you know, what I like about the 100-day moving average is only when I feel like, you know, something's really getting away from me, I'll, I'll switch that 100-day moving average because it, it just leaves a lot – it, it, it just leaves a lot more profit in the tank for me if, indeed, things do reverse. Now, will, will there be times where I get stopped out and, 
you know, the stock rallies on after that? Absolutely. You know, you got to know the pros and cons of everything that you're going into and just accept it before you go in. But, you know, just to summarize and answer your question, I don't mess around a whole lot with the, the moving averages below the 50, but I mainly stick with the 50, 200 simple moving average, but we'll switch to the 100 if I'm fortunate enough to be in a pretty profitable trade. But okay. with that said, Joe, I'll add one caveat to that. And I'd, I'd love to hear Nina and Rick's opinion on this. I am not opposed to swapping moving averages to a given chart to see if the stock is re responding to a certain moving average. If I pulled up a chart of Visa right now, I would see that over the last year plus, it's responded very well to the 100-day moving average. So I might make a note that this should be the indicator I would use for that stock, whereas maybe I take a look at something like Apple or the broader markets, and I'll say, you know what? It's not really responding to the 100, but it certainly seems to be responding to the 200. And, you know, I can be cheeky enough to say it's responding to the 170-day moving average as well. All we're doing is creating an average price over time to establish our personal support and resistance. Yeah, I'll, I'll, Joe, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll jump no, in. No, please, Rick, go add, for add it. Yep. Do that. Um, yeah, Ken, I, I'm the same way in the sense that I have no problem, uh, you know, call it curve fitting if you want, but really what we're doing here is we're trying to find the indicator that is best representing the activity of the stock. So, you know, perfect example of something like that would be if you have a cyclical stock and, you know, you want to use something like a displaced moving average. Um, there are strategies for deciding what the right cycle length is for a displaced moving average, but the way I like to do it is I like to shift it a few places, and if it fits, great, and if it doesn't, I shift it some more. Um, that may not seem really technically pure to some people, uh, but I always remind people we're not after technical purity. We're after money. So. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we are. Nina, any any comment on that? Or? Yeah, no, definitely some stocks, let's say I follow the 50-day, some stocks definitely don't follow the 50-day. So you do have to, you know, f you know, find one. I have to say I typically will go for those, you know, I'll then see does it follow the 100-day. I don't know if I tweak it and go to the 170-day. I probably just, you know, I get, you know, I probably just leave it on the 200-day, 100-day, but that's Interesting. I'm probably going to have to start seeing if maybe I should start tweaking it a bit and, you know, using some slightly different different numbers. So I'm going to check that out. It's a good idea. Um, appreciate the conversation on that. Um, let's see. A couple more things. We've got less than 10 minutes. So a couple things maybe we, we can talk about. We do our analysis and, you know, it goes the opposite way. You know, and we've got a position on. And really, the next thing I want to talk about probably are your favorite setups. But let's talk about, boom, you got a position on, you know, maybe it's a bullish position, and your analysis breaks down and it goes the wrong way. Rick, you want to start with how you might approach either getting out of that trade, doubling down, or, or your approach? Yes. <laughs> no, that, and that will happen. It's not a matter of if. It's a question of how soon. Um, my, I, I, this is one of the soap boxes that I get up on, and that, and that is uh, making sure that you manage risk properly because you, you get one shot at really blowing it. You know, I, I tell people one catastrophic loss and you start all over again. Um, so my approach is to do my full analysis and understand what my target is for a profit, but more importantly, where my escape point is for a loss. And I do that before I ever press the button for executing the trade. So, um, it, and again, it, it flows from the analysis, the technical analysis. I don't, I never set stops on a uh, on an option position. If anything, what I'm going to do is set an alert on the underlying, and then be prepared to go in and analyze it and make a decision. But I I, I will never ever get into a trade without knowing exactly where my where my threshold is where i'm going to say no more this is as far as it's going to go and uh, you know there are occasions where i might take a binary trade where you know i might maybe take a a, a spread trade and say i'm i'm either going to get max profit max loss or somewhere in between but i'm just going to put it on because uh, you know, we all, I think, are in Ken's situation uh, where there are times when we just don't have time to watch it day by day. But if I know what my max loss and my max gain and something in between is going in, and I'm okay with that from a risk standpoint, 
uh, then that's that's a suitable trade. That's not that's not being careless. Um, so uh, I, uh, a perfect example, and I'll just I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, my, my son is learning. My son's 21 years old. He's learning how to trade. He did his first option trade this last this past week, and and I was able to walk through and see through his eyes the the emotion that I'd kind of forgotten about. Um, you will get emotional with your trades if you have not traded this yet. It will happen. And the best way to temper emotions is with numbers. It doesn't doesn't mean it becomes a you know a, a black box trade where you just uh, you know if A then B. Um, but technical analysis, in, in my experience, does a great job with just helping you stay on track. Fabulous point. Fabulous uh, boy. Uh, Nina, uh, thoughts on the whole risk management perspective? All right. So for risk management, I typically do do spreads. Now, I typically don't sell naked calls. I'll sell a call spread. Now, if I want to sell puts, I might do that if I don't mind owning the stock. Okay. But typically, I do spreads, and the size of the number of contracts that you do, that's key. Because if you start loading up on the number of contracts, then, you know, that one strategy can become your full-time job that you're trying to manage. So for me, I try to uh, keep it to risk levels that I'm comfortable with. And then I also monitor the position over time because you have this expiration always looming. So if the strategy is not working out for you by a certain time frame, then you have to decide, you know, what are you going to do? What size of, uh, you know, a loss? And this is something you should think about in advance. What size of a loss are you comfortable with? But at least if it's limited risk with the spread, you already know that up front. And if it's, um, you know, if I bought the spread and um, it's just not working out, I might close it out uh, at, you know, maybe a, maybe a, you know, 70% loss, or I might, if it's very close to expiration and it's worthless and I waited too long, you know, just might let it go. If you're short the options, if you sold the spread, I don't make the, the credit that I received the max profit potential. I don't try to make that my goal. If I sold the spread, I try to buy it back, you know, try to buy it back and lock in that profit so that I can move on and uh, use my money for something else or just get rid of the risk. So I, I, you know, I don't make the max profit my goal and uh, try to exit my position early. Now, if it is an earnings play and it's a short-term play, then, of course, you're, you're waiting for the earnings announcement, and I try to get out as soon after earnings as possible. I don't try to hold it to the very end. And so, um, you know, you have to pay attention to volatility and, and um, when is that expiration. Good disciplines to keep in business, for sure. Uh, yes. Can, can, can risk management side of things? Yeah, well, it's that one thing that you have to do and you have to have, and uh, certainly one thing that people hate to do. Um, you know, in this business, it's not how much you make, it's really how much you keep. Because, you know, as Rick said, it's not a question of when you're going to be wrong or if. I mean, it's, it's really when. And, you know, math just works against us, you know. Um, you know, you lose 20% on that capital, you're going to have to make 25 to get back to even. And as the losses grow, what you need to make back starts to get exponentially more difficult. You lose 33%, you got to make 50. You lose 50, you got to make 100. You know, you, you lose 75%, you got to make 400. You lose 80%, you got to make 500%. So, you know, I always look at trading as really running a business. And, you know, taxes and losses are the biggest cost my business is going to incur. And I want to try to limit those as much as possible. And if that means I limit some of my profits, so be it. You know, anyone looking to establish a strategy that's going to both maximize profits and eliminate losses, uh, you know, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, I really want to make sure this is mapped out ahead of time, whether it's a spot for the underlying on the chart for an options trade or just a flat percentage loss that I'm willing to lose. You know, quite honestly, if I can make two bucks every time I lose a dollar, you know, I've only got to be right 33% of the time. So, you know, anytime I'm setting up a trade, I'm looking at risk reward, and I never want to risk a lot to make a little unless the probabilities are in my favor. And 
that could not be any truer than with options, for example. In other words, if I'm doing a vertical spread and I want to go out of the money, you know, I could risk very little to make a lot, which is great. You know, if I'm doing a binary trade like Rick, Rick had mentioned, maybe you're playing earnings, uh, that's a great way to go. Or, you know, I could risk a lot to make a little and I could do a vertical call spread within the money options and the stock could even go down and I could still be profitable. You know, that's why I want to know what my max gain losses are, where the stock needs to be for these things to happen. And, you know, with options, you really got to keep an eye on it every day. Even if you're a covered call trader, there's no such thing as an option strategy that does not require active management. Certainly some require a more keen eye than others. But, you know, I've always got to keep my eye on that because things can trade, change very quickly. And certainly technology these days can automate a lot of that uh, for us. Uh, but in the end, you really need to map this out before you get in because, trust me, we're programmed to take more pain <laughs> when we're losing money uh, than we are to take more risk when we're making it. And, and that's a tough thing that our rules will have to overcome. Well, uh, yeah, and that, that's where that emotion that Rick was referring to can come into play as well. I uh, Believe it or not, I mean, our, our time has absolutely flown by. I got a lot more questions, but, you know, I think in fairness to – the folks online, how about if we just give everybody, you know, one opportunity to, to close things out. Rick, how about if I start with you? Yeah, well, first of all, Joe, thank you for this invitation. Uh, and uh, for the, uh, Ken, uh, Nita, I appreciate that, and uh, everybody for joining today. Um, I will just reiterate what's been the theme today, and that is I think you would be hard-pressed to be – long-term successful in trading without a good understanding of technical analysis. So if, if you're one of the 20% that's never done it or you've done it for just a short time, continue down that path and encourage you to do that. Um, as, uh, as I said in my introduction, I, I lead the education team at E-Trade. We uh, have, have a lot to offer and uh, would invite you to visit us at etrade.com slash events. And that will show you everything we have coming up, uh, both live and online. So uh, join us there. And uh, thanks again. Appreciate it. It was a very enjoyable day today. Thank you, Rick, for uh, making the time. Nina? So we, we did. We covered a lot today. So technical analysis, you can incorporate it into your options trading. It can help you find those strike prices because maybe that's where you feel that the stock is going to go, or maybe the stock's going to stay more likely out of a certain region, depending upon the option strategy that you're selecting. But the important thing is to monitor your strategies, monitor your, you know, I like to button up my risk and do spreads. That way I know what the risk is coming into the strategy, and sizing is key. I don't like to get carried away with the number of contracts. And if you'd like to find out more about technical analysis, we have a team of analysts. So please join us at schwab.com slash live online. You could sign up for webcasts there. And that's where I also do options sessions. And uh, we've got our July schedule coming up soon. So thank you, Joe, for this opportunity. And I'm glad I got to meet this panel today. Thank you. You're welcome, Nina. Thank you so much. Uh, really, the time flew by. We never did, did get to talk about, you know, the size of positions, which you just mentioned. So maybe we'll get this group together one more time or a couple times in the future. But thank you, Nina. Ken, take us home. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think, you know, even if you don't decide to use technical analysis, it's important to have at least a base knowledge of it in 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 the coffers. Uh, that way, when you've done all your fundamental homework, it'll, it'll continue to get you to ask the question why when a stock's not doing, you know, what you think it's going to do. Um, you know, I got a lot of sympathy for folks that are out there new to, to options, that are new to technical analysis. I know this is a lot like drinking from the fire hose. You are not going to retain everything. Uh, but, you know, take, take this, you know, to heart. You'll never stop learning. You know, always can continue to kind of build on what you got and sharpen the skills. Learn from your mistakes. Uh, you'll find that if you can establish a set of rules, that the hard part isn't coming up with the rules. It's really doing what you said you were going to do. And, you know, a lot of times people will come to me with very elaborate strategies, perhaps looking for a blessing or something like that. But, you know, I, I am 
way more impressed with someone that just simply uses a simple trend following strategy and does what they says says they're going to do than people that really try to impress me with a whole lot of math and numbers and things like that. I mean, I, you know, I, I've said it once, I'll say it again, all strategies work, it's just sometimes they don't. And that's why, you know, technical analysis is important, but you've really got to dovetail that risk management in there, whether you're trading options, equities, doesn't matter. Uh, you've got to have some sort of ripcord to protect you from yourself when you're wrong. You know, and, and Fidelity's got a ton of education as well. You know, we have regional brokerage consultants all across the country. There's about 16, 17 of us. So no matter what, uh, you know, metropolitan center you're in, you know, the branches can get you in touch with us or our trading strategy desk, which is a group of folks on the phones that have appointments with our clients to help marry their technical strategies with our tools. So uh, if you have any questions, please just give us a call. Thanks, Ken. Uh, and really to... Uh... Nina, Ken, and Rick, thank you so much. Alex, I'll turn it back to you. And attendees, we told you we had a good panel today. I hope you agree. Uh, great job. We could have done three hours with no problem, I'm sure. <laughs> Alex, Absolutely. back to you. Thank you, Joe, and to our panelists. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time today. While we weren't able to get to all of your options-related questions, we have our investor services team ready to help. Feel free to reach out to them at options at the OCC.com or click the Contact Us widget at the bottom of your screen. Many of you asked for further education. Please visit op, uh, optionseducation.org and see the Getting Started section for further reading. You can also access OIC's My Path assessment to gauge your options knowledge and receive a custom learning ex, uh, program for you to advance your investing skills. If you would like to learn more about what the Options Industry Council has to offer, be sure to check out our website, www.optionseducation.org. You can connect with us on social media to stay up to date for the latest. And with that, thank you for attending. And for those uh, who made it to multiple sessions, thank you for your time. If you missed us, then you can access the past webinars using the URL link um, below, and those, those links will also be emailed to you for uh, replays. And uh, with that, thank you again, and we hope to see you uh, next month. Investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you heard on today's show, email Joe Burgoyne at options at the OCC.com. Or you can call OIC's Investor Services at 1-888-OPTIONS. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore EDU. Or join their group on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out our next episode of the wide world of options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.